Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's science talk. Uh, we will be recording the talk, so please can you turn your cameras and microphones off whilst we are recording. <coughs> also, please avoid using the chat function uh, in Teams as the notifications and pop ups can be very distracting. Um, as such, we have a Google Jamboard set up for any questions you may have, and the link is already available in the chat. We will discuss these at the end of the presentation if we have time. Um, should you experience any technical difficulties today, uh, please do message either myself or Nikki Harris for support. I'd like to welcome, first of all, Nikki Newton, who's a senior biodiversity evidence specialist and TPOP manager in the ecosystems analysis team here at JNCC. Over to you now, Nikki. Thank you very much, Josh. Um, hopefully everyone can see the slides um, and hear me. Um, so welcome to the second event in the UK Teapot 2021 online festival, where for the first year we've merged with the JNCC Science Talk series for some of our events. Our event today is the second in a two-part series of webinars looking at breaking down barriers to inclusion in biological recording. So in our first event, we had um, some really interesting talks from butterfly conservation and amphibian and reptile conservation. And if you missed these and are keen to catch up on them later, the talks available to view on the JNCC YouTube channel. Um, right now, however, we've got some more exciting guest speakers lined up today from our partner organisations, Plant Life and Bat Conservation Trust to talk to us um, about experiences in their, um, in their organisations. So I don't want to dwell on this slide too long because it will look really familiar for anyone who joined the first talk. Um, however, just for those of you who are unfamiliar with TPOP, um, this is a quick summary of who we are. Um, the organisations in the box on the left in various combinations fund, organise, run and steer the terrestrial monitoring and surveillance in the box on the right, um, all of which engages volunteers to undertake the majority of recording. Um, many of the challenges or opportunities relevant for engaging volunteers with monitoring one taxon are also relevant for other taxa. So it's beneficial for us to work together um, to collaborate, exchange knowledge and problem solve together. Um, and we aim to do this as the UK Terrestrial Evidence Partnership of Partnerships or TPOP. Um, every year TPOP has a conference or in recent years a series of online webinars and workshops to collaboratively explore various topics of interest. Um, and this year for TPOP's fifth birthday, we've expanded up to six exciting events over a two month period. Um, we've merged with the JNCC Science Talks for three of the events this year. Um, that's these two talks on barriers for, to inclusion um, and the last talk on developing indicators. Um, and if you wish to find out any more details on joining any of the events, please do contact my team at the TPOP mailbox um, and recordings from the events will be made available online on the YouTube channel, as I said. Um, so at the start of part one of this webinar series, I described some of the outputs from our workshop on volunteer diversity last year. And if you want to look at the notes from this workshop, Google the line in purple on the screen there, um, and they're accessible on the JNCC resource hub. The second of these workshops we held um, in February was about how we can better understand the demographics of volunteers currently engaged with biological recording. Um, and therefore, um, if, we know, if we know this, we should be able to see how any actions we take to break down barriers to inclusion might be having an impact. So within the workshop, we discussed whether collecting information on volunteer demographics would be most effectively achieved through one-off um, volunteer diversity surveys or through diversity data collection at sign up, or maybe a combination of these, or maybe something else entirely. Um, we also work through data protection impact assessments, which are required for compliance with GDPR when collecting this type of information. Um, and we thought about what types of diversity data we wanted to collect. Um, since this workshop, BCT have undertaken quite a bit of work in this area, acting as a bit of a pilot scheme. Um, and they've learned quite a lot in the process, which Philip's going to share with us later on today. Um, and we hope that the lessons learned by BCT will help to inform appropriate action for other TPOP schemes over the next year um, to help to introduce this type of survey or modify sign up forms to collect valuable information on volunteer demographics across the partnerships. Um, as we aim to break down the barriers to inclusion in recording, um, through taking actions such as working with ambassadors for underrepresented groups or creating targeted training resources or working more with local communities. Having this understanding of who we are successfully involving in schemes will help to see if we're making a difference. So as well as hearing from Philip Briggs, who's the monitoring manager from Back Conservation Trust later on about this, 
Um, we'll first be hearing from Sarah Shuttleworth, who is the National Plant Monitoring Scheme Volunteer Manager from Plant Life, um, about Plant Life's experiences of engaging new volunteers from a range of backgrounds and activities and the associated successes, challenges and lessons learned. So over to Sarah. OK, so uh, yeah, as Nikki said, I'm Sarah Shuttleworth, currently the National Plant Monitoring Scheme Volunteer Manager at Plant Life. Um, however, I've only been doing this for the last year, so there's been lots to learn for me in the process as well. So in this sort of really brief look, I'm just going to go zooming through, zoom being the operative word these days, um, and take a look at things from a sort of whole plant life viewpoint, um, but then also sort of look at um, particular focus uh, on the National Plant Monitoring Scheme. So that's our largest citizen science project. So um, I'm sure most of you are aware of plant life and who we are and what we do, but just quickly and brief, um, we're a wild plant conservation charity working globally. Um, our latest strategy, which has only just been released, has that our mission is to protect and restore, so the diversity of wild plants and fungi, to connect people with nature and improve well-being and inspire action. Um, to work in partnerships so that all sectors of society can contribute to tackling the climate and nature crisis that we all face and to collaborate and influence on the world stage to then empower societies to protect. Um, we currently have a membership base that's growing, um, but it's currently at 13 and a half thousand. Uh, we have over 300 registered specific plant life volunteers. Um, but we also have over 3,000 participants in several of our other recording schemes, such as the um, Every Flower Counts, Cow Slips, Wax Caps, etc. Um, we have 1,600 volunteers allocated a square within the National Plant Monitoring Scheme, um, but in total there are about 2,000 that are registered with the project, they just aren't allocated a square yet. Um, we also have other projects um, with volunteers, so about 2,000 other volunteers within partnership, partnership projects over 60 members of staff and we work with over 50 different partner organisations, so quite a broad range. So participant, participation and inclusion at Plant Life, so I'll go over the following aspects, so looking at our sort of whole organisational approach um, and with all of us, I'm sure we're all in the sort of same boat here, it's all something we're working on um, to try and be more equal, diverse and inclusive as we go forward. But what we can do is go over what we've learned the last few years, um, although so much of it is sort of really only been learned in the last 18 months or so, especially with having to increase sort of our digital presence, which is a bit of a forced hand situation. Uh, and then I'll go into the specifics looking at the National Plant Monitoring Scheme. So when we are inclusive and ensure that there is a quality of opportunity, we then become more diverse. Um, in terms of our organisational approach, we're obviously trying to tackle all elements of our work in all these ways. So we know that inclusion means listening, active listening, that is, and understanding, um, allowing different voices to shape our work, identifying any barriers that we can find, and then being open to co-design or co-creation. So equality can mean um, equality of opportunity with choices, um, working at ways to reduce those barriers, um, different um, options and no one size fits all approach. Diversity means not only who we engage with, but who we are. Uh, so diversity within ourselves as an organisation and all of this can create di greater diversity of thinking and ideas coming forward. Um, and we need to be as representative as we can as well. So currently we're working on all of these things, as I mentioned on the slide before. Um, across the whole organisation and that's looking at whether it be up at the strategic level right down to the delivery of projects. So this means that our strategies and creative thinking um, and then right down to um, from the needs of, of, of the, um, you know, an individual project from when it's created. Um, so this is like how we're planning inwardly and allowing co-design where we can. Um, and then obviously looking at um, designing projects from the beginning, but also projects that are already ongoing. So it's about thinking about where our gaps are in our audience bases and whether we can reach out to them. So this can include going directly to these groups and finding out what their barriers are for inclusion uh, or why they have not wanted to previously participate. Uh, so one of our good examples um, that you know I can talk about aside from the National Plant Monitoring Scheme 
is a project called Dynamic Dunescapes Partnership um, that identified a need to look specifically at some of the older generation who are generally more prevalent in the coastal areas um, and how they could be involved um, more with the project. So, for example, with dementia in this project, they put a call out to people who are living with or affected by dementia and asked them if they would like to help shape the project. So this crucial, crucial stage at the beginning led to the creation of a dementia toolkit for site managers and organisations that had dune habitats. So this included on how these site managers and organisations can organise their own projects with dementia in mind. So it's really important that we also look at existing projects that we have going. Um, so, for example, the MPMS, we're looking back at it um, and developing um, generally a framework within the organisation or a checklist so that all of these stages can um, be checked to ensure that we're taking things into consideration as a whole. So some of the areas of activity that we've been learning from um, in general, so digital participation. So we've all <laughs> had to really um, sort of pull our socks up really when it comes to engaging in a completely different way and using online um, versions of everything. So whether that be to training and talks via webinars or Zoom meetings, um, YouTube videos, online learning systems, et cetera, but also um, creating apps for participating. Um, and in particular, going forward, we're looking at uh, digital volunteering as another avenue um, for getting people involved in a different way. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work with things like forest bathing and wellness. Um, so kind of a different approach to appreciating nature, which I know that many of us all know about how it's been proven how important nature is to um, our sort of well-being and, and state of mind. Um, so we've been doing different things like that. And that includes maybe working with completely new partnerships or organisations that we've not previously worked with. Uh, I mentioned the um, Dunescapes Dementia work that we've been doing. Um, we've also been running some art workshops, um, sort of events online, which have definitely brought in new audiences and getting us sort of um, interacting with different people. So in spring, we had a series called Spring Into Action, which included some watercolour sessions, for example, focusing on species like beach or snowdrop. Um, and our next digital series, which is Fall Into Nature, we're joining the dots more obviously with this, including art and conservation as an actual discussion topic and how conservation issues could be tackled sort of with creativity in mind. So these other areas of exploration into other topics and event types have really widened the diversity of people that we work with and can potentially influence. So to go into a little bit more detail and focusing on our biggest citizen science recording scheme, uh, the National Plant Monitoring Scheme, um, we can start to sort of unpick and start looking at some of the blocking points or some of the barriers that maybe um, you know people face and why they don't participate and then hopefully find solutions that we can use in this instance, but also lead to solutions across further projects and schemes. Uh, another particular reason that it was uh, a good idea to look at the MPMS is that recently, uh, back in March this year, we had a deeper look into the inclusivity of the scheme. So we had a little project commission to look at that. Um, so I'll go into it just briefly some of those findings as I go along. So it's no real surprise that when we investigated the, the participation, um, which was uh, from a survey done in 2017, which I think looked at about 521 people that came back to us. More females than males are taking part, um, despite actually more males than females being represented in the botanical sector sort of professionally. Three quarters of those surveyed um, were living in a rural setting and less than 12% were under 40 years old. Again, probably not a big shock to everyone. The report also looked at how inclusive the scheme is with things like looking at the website and the materials and resources and the training that's um, provided. So when we look at the actual purpose of the scheme, um, what is it for? Um, it's obviously to collect robust data so we can envir monitor environmental change. Um, but the people who take part are obviously intrinsically linked with it. Um, so it needed to be thought of together at the creation stage. So it was designed with the people that were taking part in mind. Um, and the scheme is obviously completely dependent on those taking part. Therefore, they need to feel valued, but also feel like they're getting something from it personally. So this might be from the knowledge that their efforts are contributing to significant measures of change that could affect conservation strategies, etc. 
Um, therefore, it's really important to include them in the communication about the data and the results and widen that circle of information. They may feel like they're growing their own knowledge from being involved. Um, maybe that's sort of from the training and the support that's provided, in which case these elements need to stay strong and evolve um, to ensure that people continue their learning journey and also allow for feedback on these processes so that we can adapt if need be. They could feel like they are part of a community of citizen scientists, both virtually across the whole of the UK or locally with connections to other local sur surveyors. This is why it's really important to develop social connections online virtually by use of social media across a range of platforms, um, but also sort of Zoom video calls um, or events, which have now become obviously more widely accepted as a means of staying in touch anyway. But also by running some in-person events to get people to meet other volunteers and develop partnerships for knowledge sharing. Um, we also encourage buddying up um, so that people can do squares um, sort of as, a, as a, a couple of people doing it together or even adopted by multiple surveyors or sort of um, natural history groups for that sort of thing. So when we look at the specific barriers for the scheme, um, they can involve any one of these real elements from physically not being able to participate, um, in which case sometimes I've suggested um, for those volunteers that contact us and say, you know, I've been part of the scheme, but now I feel like I can no longer get out to my square because I'm not physically fit enough or able to, then we've suggested whether they could be a mentor instead or an option to buddy up with another surveyor so they could teach them and hand the square over to them. Um, a person may feel that they do not know enough about biological recording or plants, um, in which case, you know, we try to get across um, over that with the fact that we have the choice of uh, surveyor level. So they can enter it at the wildflower level, which is slightly lower, the intermediate level indicator or the full sort of botanical knowledge level at the top inventory. Um, the scheme doesn't cost to be part of and the resources are provided free of charge and all the training is free. However, potentially travel costs to and from a square could be a potential barrier. But again, the squares are chosen by the individual. Um, public transport might not be an option because they're rural or the cost might be too much um, or just not convenient. Other barriers could be technological barriers, um, which could be that they're, you know, they're, they're nervous of using the website or uploading data that way. Um, so we've got to make sure we provide the right amount of training and support um, and choices for them to how to participate really. So what are we actually asking people to do and how may that, how might that affect equality of opportunity and diversity? So each interested person in the scheme can choose whether they want to register and be part of the scheme and then which square they would like to choose to allocate to themselves. So due to the nature of the randomised sampling methods of one kilometre square locations, these squares are not always somewhere somebody would want to choose to survey um, for obvious reasons to eliminate bias. However, they can view which squares are available to them to near to the or near to the location they're interested in before they actually sign up to the scheme. So again, we've we've given them choice at that point. Although suggested uh, plot locations are given via a numerical grid, they can also choose where to locate their plots where they feel is best suited. We simply give them guidance on best practice for these steps. There's flexibility in the number of plots and plot locations and types and support is given with these stages. Um, via several methods, either individual contact um, or sort of email or phone or via videos guiding people through these stages. And we also have guidance notes, obviously, and frequently asked questions. We always ensure that we can assist with landowner queries if needed. Um, so using land registry via our own account if we have to. Um, there's also flexibility in when they want to carry out the survey, so choosing when that suits them rather than stipulating exact dates and months. Um, the submission of data is then given as a choice between you could use the, the app in the field directly um, or you could enter it on the website when you get back or even people can send in paper forms if they feel this is the only way for them. Uh, we also provide a specific webinar on date, data entry which is also recorded and available online website guidance videos and data entry, um, as well as one-to-one -one Zoom sessions on data entry. 
what are we providing people and how can what we provide be more inclusive? So the methodology is provided in the form of a guidance notes booklet, um, which is obviously a printed out booklet and it now includes photos of the habitats. But this is also sent electronically via a link to the freely available PDF version under the resources on the website. Um, but they are also posted out a copy as well. Uh, we also aim to try and have it available on the app at some point as well. They're also sent then a species list booklet, again, both electronically via link and an ID book, the same, and sent survey forms and a colour copy of their one kilometre square. Again, all these resources are emailed to them, posted to them, and are also available on the website. And the website also has a lot more um, resources, including the online training videos, um, the materials and things like that. Um, the website has been highlighted through the inclusivity study as needing some minor changes to make it more inclusive. So we, it was using a website checker, which can pick up things like uh, contrast issues and missing alternative text. Um, if nobody's familiar with alternative text, it's basically the description that you would put to each of your images. Um, so if we were using this particular image right here, I've gone through the whole of this um, PowerPoint um, got and, and typed in the old, old text for each of the images, whereas Microsoft Word would default to something like the, um, that this is a, a flower, whereas if somebody's participating in biological recording, they might want to know what species it is. So this is for people that are maybe partially sighted and they've got a reading software program which would read out the text on the screen. Um, but if I hadn't have put in that this was common knapweed, then it would just say a picture of a flower. And it would say that for almost all of them, because obviously there's lots of pictures of flowers on a plant recording scheme. Um, so it's just things like that. But these things do take time. And so it's worth bearing in mind that perhaps these elements need to be built in to projects or within roles that people need to make sure that there's time to make all of these things um, as good as they can be. Um, on our YouTube channel, we also have a playlist on website guidance, which can take people through the website. Um, and we also have um, under our webinar recordings, sort of the whole general introduction to the NPMS so they can watch that and fully understand the scheme. Um, as I mentioned, we have the YouTube video uh, channel, but we also have all of the videos actually embedded within the website themselves. So if people don't want to be going to YouTube specifically, then they can just watch them on the website. Um, we also have a mentoring scheme, which is something that we are sort of in the process of developing. Um, but the idea is, is that we would have um, specific volunteers that would get to the point of being a mentor that could help other participants in the scheme, whether that be with um, identification of plants or methodology questions or maybe data entry. Um, we've also got um, social media accounts um, across all the platforms. Um, which can be used for people to engage with us and ask questions, which it does, it's useful. Uh, it is interesting that something like the Instagram account, which has only really sort of launched at the end of last year, has a greatest following in the age range bracket of 25 to 34, which is very different to say um, our Twitter and Facebook followers and obviously the large majority of people participating in the scheme. So we're also looking at the idea of reaching out to even younger audience, maybe through TikTok or something, but that's totally just an idea at the moment. But it's really important to note that we don't just post the same content across all of the platforms, um, but you try to tailor the content to actually be the most engaging to that audience that's going to be receiving it. So by its nature, the NPMS has limitations, but we can work hard to be inclusive, actively listen and provide a quality of opportunity to overcome some of the barriers. I really do think it's worth pointing out that we must still offer the choice and don't start to exclude those that don't use social media or computers, for example, because um, we do still have a few volunteers who send in their data on paper forms, as I mentioned. And if we were to turn around and say, sorry, we're only going to be doing it online, then we would um, they would probably leave the scheme and we would all lose all of that expertise. So I think one of the kind of key points moving forward as an organisation, but also as a monitoring um, scheme is to look at making sure we include choice in how we engage. And the more pe options people have to encounter us, then more people we encounter and from a wider spread of audiences in theory. So internally as an organisation, we've been exploring these issues. Um, we had a diversity workshop earlier in the year um, and we're now having open sessions um, with the CEO every week, which I think is a really good opportunity to create uh, diversity within your own organisation if everyone feels like their, their ideas can have a voice. 
Um, you know, can we look at transferable skills within an organization, engaging more people generally as an organization? Um, I think something like an EDI statement is great um, and policies and things, but are we actually being proactive with it? And I think that's the question. Um, but yeah, so as an organization, I guess we are trying to change and with the M NPM, NPMS, we're looking at ways that we can try and reach greater audiences and get more people to participate. Thanks very much, Sarah. That was really interesting. Um, great to hear more about the NPMS in, um, from that sort of inclusivity angle. Um, uh, I'd like to encourage everybody to put questions into Jamboard um, if you've got them. I think, I don't know, Josh, whether it's worth reposting the link in the um, chat just in case people joining um, later on haven't can't see it. Um, but yes, I encourage some questions. Um, and we will look at them at the end after we've heard from Philip Briggs, uh, Monitoring Manager from Back Conservation Trust. Over to you, Philip. OK, yeah, so thank you for um, inviting me to give this talk. Uh, my name is Philip Briggs. I'm the Monitoring Manager at the Back Conserva Conservation Trust, which mainly involves um, doing project management for the National Bat Monitoring Programme, which is our, our long running citizen science programme. And I've actually been at BCT now about 18 years this week, in fact, <laughs> um, originally starting off as the MBMP survey coordinator and then moving into a more management role um, about five years later. OK, so just a very brief introduction to that Conservation Trust. Um, I've put our main objectives here on the screen um, with the leading UK NGO solely devoted to the conservation of bats and the landscapes on which they rely within the UK. Um, our key work areas include the National Bat Monitoring Programme, which I'll mainly be focusing on in this talk, the National Bat Helpline, membership and communications, work on biodiversity policy and advocacy, work with the building and development sector and woodland managers, wildlife crime and, and a great deal more. We've got around about 30 staff, um, about 6,500 members, and within the MBMP, we have about 1,500 active volunteers. And improving diversity within, um, among our supporters and among our staff has become increasingly high on our agenda in the last couple of years. The first project, uh, first project relating to diversity and inclusion was over 10 years ago, the Count Bat project, which ran between 2008 and 2012. And this was focused very much on external engagement and trying to work towards that vision and involving as wide a spectrum of people as possible in bat conservation. And we also ran a follow up Count Bat project in Wales. We focused on a number of key audiences, including visually impaired, hard of hearing and ethnic minorities. And the project was really successful. We successfully engaged with these communities through partners already working with them, for example, the Black Environment Network, and we produced a number of resources, including a DVD called Bats for All. This has activities and promotions, as well as case studies from the project, so what worked and what didn't. And they're free to download from our website, so they can continue to be used by BCT, BAT groups, and others who want to work with these communities. But although the resources live on, and some BAT groups have continued to maintain those relationships, when the funding ran out, we no longer had any engagement staff and the impetus was inevitably lost. So that's a real learning point and one we need to bear in mind as we move for forward in trying to increase more diversity to the sector. So our main citizen science project, which I'll, I'll be focusing on, is the National Bat Monitoring Programme. This has been running since 1996 and it collects data through a range of surveys, which are geared to um, all levels of experience. So ranging from the Sunset Survey, which is perfect for complete beginners, up to the hibernation survey where you need a suitable bat survey class license in, in order to be able to take part. And the core surveys enable us to produce annual species population trends for 11 species or species groups at the, at the GB and England levels, five species in Scotland, eight species in Wales, one species in Northern Ireland and one species at UK level. So those that's where we have the high enough sample sizes to be able to produce species population trends. The key volunteer engagement methods are listed here, and I think as will be the case for all of us, social media has the biggest reach. We have a specific MBMP Facebook group, which currently has 2,500 members. 
whereas the BCT Facebook group has over 121,000 followers and our Twitter account 53,000 followers. So there is a great um, medium for really reaching out to a very wide audience. We've got a very we've got a dedicated comms team maintaining the BCT account. Within the MBMP team, our capacity can be a bit stretched when it comes to adding new content to our own Facebook page. But this summer, our team has temporarily expanded, enabling us to do a lot more, uh, which I will describe shortly. And training workshops are a more time intensive way of engaging you and existing volunteers in the MBMP. And judging from the workshop feedback, these events have a big impact on attendees' interest and knowledge of BATS though it can still be quite challenging to convert this engagement into actual participation in surveys, with the main barriers identified by volunteers being the need to develop more confidence through practice and joining experts in the field. This year we have promoted um, the building up of skills and confidence through attendance of three workshops. So starting with a free of charge workshop for complete beginners called Discover Your Local Bats, followed by level one and level two bat detector workshops. And these have proved really popular with many attendees attending all three of the sessions. And once we've received all of this year's survey data returns, we'll review whether this approach has converted more workshop attendees into active MBMP surveyors. Like everyone else, we've had to move our events online last year and this year, uh, but we're discovering how beneficial this is in reaching bigger and more widely spread audiences. And one thing, once things return more to normal, we plan to continue online workshops alongside the tra traditional in-person training. And our comms team help us to get the, the MBMP into the media, for example, items on Spring Watch, and will occasionally attend events where they promote BCT's work and ways people can get involved. Talk about a project which we've um, which we piloted in recent years. One of our key goals is to, to engage younger adults because there are widespread concerns that there is a decline in young people with species identification skills, which are critical to help ensure we have a future generation of wildlife recorders carrying out the vital monitoring of the UK's wildlife. And this has come across at conferences and in newspaper articles. So the aim of the Training the Next Generation project is to train students in the skills needed to identify bats in the field based on the bats echolocation calls and visual clues. In the first phase of the project, we managed to bring in around £12,000 of funding from different charitable trusts, which enabled us to develop the resources by back detecting equipment to give to the universities and to deliver training at three universities. For a fourth university, the University of Gloucestershire, actually approached us with funding for training and this project was a good fit for what they wanted. Um, but you can see we've had pretty good participation, so we've trained 90 students so far across these four, four universities. At the end of the training, the students were asked to complete an online quiz based on what they had learned, and at the end they could see their score, and we could also view and download the scores in order to assess our success in teaching these new skills. All the students got at least half the answers right, which is a good result for complete beginners, and several students got them all right. And the feedback from the evaluation form was extremely positive, with students placing really high value on the skills they had learned. These students were mostly doing science or ecology degrees, but we also had a few students from other disciplines such as IT. And the experience of seeing bats in the field was clearly a real eye opener for many of them. And we plan to put in a new funding bid to roll out this project more widely once things return more to normal. And you can see <clears throat> just from the evaluation form how students intended to use the new skills. So um, um, a large proportion put for future career, also university coursework, recording bats on campus, taking part in national recording scheme, own personal interest, etc. Or I just love learning cool stuff was one of the more individual responses. OK, I will now come on to a few pieces of work that we've been able to do in the last year, thanks to funding from JNCC's pot of money for improving diversity. Um, so when this funding became available, we were actually in a good position to, to really take advantage of this. So the first bit of work was an in-depth volunteer questionnaire developed by Birdsong with our input. And there were two main sections, one about experienced, um, sorry, one about previous, well, current and former volunteers' motivations and experiences of taking part in the MBMP, 
and one comprising a very in-depth demographics questionnaire. And that's what I will focus on here. So I won't go into too much detail because actually the results are pretty similar to what we've seen from seen presented from similar exercises um, at the, 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 the talks we've already had in these webinars. But a total of 654 MBMP volunteers responded to the questionnaire and approximately 630 of these answered some or all of the demographic and diversity questions. On the screen, I'm showing the results of the ethnic group question as an example, and also because it was the area which proved to have the lowest diversity. The other areas we looked at were academic education. Um, the largest proportion of respondents had an undergrad undergraduate degree, that's 35 percent. Age, 27 percent were in the 51 to 60 year category. Disability status, 80 percent said they did not have a disability, while 14 percent said they did. Religious identity and or belief, um, sex, gender and sexual orientation. But like I said, <clears throat> the results match quite closely to, to what was, we've been seeing from, from other um, recording schemes. Our funding from JNCC also covered the creation of an online demographic form as part of the MBMP sign up process, process so that we can do ongoing monitoring of our volunteer demographics. This form is optional and anonymous. The entries are not linked to volunteer records and it's proving really valuable in monitoring the diversity of new volunteers signing up to the programme. And I'll show you the current results a bit later on when I show you a few, a few wins we've had so far. <clears throat> and periodically, perhaps every one to two years, we will do an exercise where we ask all our volunteers to fill in the form again so that we can get a snapshot across all our volunteers by looking at entries within the period that this exercise is running. So it's just going to be a really great tool for just measuring how we're succeeding in our in our in our actions to improve diversity. The JNCC funding also covered the production of a volunteer recruitment strategy, and this work was awarded to More Onion, a digital mobilization agency that works with nonprofit organizations. So they carried out an extensive review of the MBMP web pages and our communications in order to develop a strategy for improving our volunteer engagement. They also produced a barrier, a, sorry, a review looking at the barriers to engaging more diverse audiences in the environmental sector, with a particular focus on ethnic diversity, since this was the category with lowest diversity in the results from the Birdsong questionnaire. Um, and I, we've got a, a, a published version of this report, which I will share. If I send to Nikki afterwards, um, if you could share it around the group, because um, it's incredibly detailed, incredibly wide reaching, and I, you know, I can't really do it justice in this in this presentation. But I will, I'll go over the key points. But um, I, you know, I would really um, recommend it as really kind of illuminating reading once it's shared around uh, the TPOP um, group. So as More Onion looks more into the issue of diversity in terms of volunteers and staff, they realised they needed to first explore the causes of the problem before exploring solutions. They therefore sought a range of opinions from those with expertise in this area. So inputs include obviously the MBMP Birdsong Volunteer Survey data, but also its views with our Chief Executive Kit Stoner alongside JNCC staff and staff from other conservation organisations working in this area and also leaders of colour in relevant roles. So here are the key headings, um, which are largely quite explanatory to some extent, but um, the, the report which we'll be sharing will obviously go into a lot more, you know, we'll give you a lot more detail on this. So the key areas which need to be looked at are representation in staff and leadership and organisational culture, recruitment practices, institutional, systemic and rural racism, the lack of access to green space and relevance of conservation to people of colour, um, organisational understanding of the value of diversity and inclusion. OK, so these are the kind of key areas which they look at. Um, and then they came up with a list of recommendations. Oh, and cult sorry, culture, trust and language was the final one. So here are the recommendations, which I'll I'll mention a few details from these recommendations, but you'll find the full details in the report, which we'll share. 
So starting with recruitment, the recommendations include avoiding blind recruitment practices and instead applying positive action and active outreach to candidates of colour. So that might mean ensuring that you've got quite a good representation in terms of in, in, in your in your final shortlist of people that you invite for interview. Developing job descriptions, reflecting what is actually needed for the job, so removing any anything that might be really um, and ensuring selection in the interview panels reflects the diversity sorts and bringing in outside paid expertise if necessary, if you don't have that diversity currently within the organisation. And then pro diversity measures internally, including um, anti racist work with staff. So that includes working to agree and formally articulate senior buy in from the leadership team and board to the, tr to, to the transformation necessary if prioritising this work reflecting it in organisational strategy and allocating adequate resourcing, auditing pay, contracts, grievances and disciplinary processes for any people of colour working in the organisation over the last decade, to look for evidence of unfair treatment and address it as necessary, setting up mentoring schemes for new recruits of colour with other people of colour outside the organisation involved in the environmental sector to give them appropriate support. I'm slightly conscious here, I'm using the wording they've used um, in their report um, to describe the, the audiences we're talking about. Um, and I know people of colour isn't necessarily the accepted term you know, for everybody. In fact, having looked into this bit, we've found probably the safest term to use, which is more generally accepted, is people from ethnic minority backgrounds. Um, and then thirdly, we've got anti-racist solidarity. So, um, that includes things like proactively supporting struggles for racial equality. And we've seen examples of this from groups such as organisations such as such as WWT, who on social media, they just actively kind of support um, different movements when there are specific kind of, I guess, days to sort of support these particular movements. And from what we've heard, sometimes this does actually alienate a few members of their existing supporters. Um, so some some that don't don't like their organizations um, sort of speaking up for for these particular movements. But um, you know it is it does seem a very important kind of thing to be um, moving towards, I think, if you're going to be perceived as some uh, a kind of sector that's much more kind of inclusive and welcoming and something that people feel is, you know, that they can be part of and start by building symbiotic relationships with specific communities supporting their activities and needs as a priority before engaging them in your own projects um, so we've been certainly doing this to some extent through the nightwatch project our new white Nightwatch project which i'll be mentioning in a moment um, and as well as diversifying the staff and volunteer base organizations should look at diversifying its trustees any steering groups and organizational champions and finally, foster cross-sectoral learning. And in fact, this is something which is, is actually happening on a regular basis through TPOP. And these webinars are obviously important parts of that because no one organisation can do this on its own. It has to be um, cross-sectoral with each of us supporting each other and learning together. OK, so I'd like to slightly embarrass a few members of our team to introduce a few members of the team who are really key to delivering this work within the MBMP. Since last September, we've been lucky to have Parvathy Vinagopal in the role of MBMP Survey Coordinator. Parvathy is from Kerala in southern India and came to England to do her PhD at Bristol University with Gareth Jones. And she's enjoying taking a break from the academic world and working on a citizen science project. And she's really focused on working to bring in volunteers from more diverse backgrounds. And she also brings to the role some interesting insights from her own background, for example, a culture where a career in conservation isn't usually on the agenda for young people, parents tending to push their children more towards careers with a perceived higher status, for example, law and medicine. Parvathy has done lots of really great work so far. She led on setting up a meeting with Helena Craig from the Black to Nature Initiative, who provided us, provided us with a wealth of valuable tips for engaging volunteers from ethnic minority backgrounds. And Parvathy has applied lots of these tips to a, a modified version of our popular free beginners workshop, Discover Your Local Bats, 
and is running a couple of sessions targeted specifically at people from ethnic minority backgrounds. And she's also starting to develop a project spec for delivering talks to schools which have pupils from diverse backgrounds in order to inspire children <clears throat> to start thinking about wildlife conservation as something they would like to do with their lives because we do we, you know we're getting an increasing understanding that this is something we need to kind of see we need to sow quite early on um, in people's kind of view of the world and what they, what they want to do and this year we've <clears throat> created two new temporary roles funded by the government's kickstart scheme which offers six month jobs for young people aged 16 to 24 year olds years old who are currently claiming universal credit and are at risk of long-term unemployment. And this wouldn't have been possible without the Race for Nature project, which was set up to support environmental charities in taking part in the scheme and has a core aim of engaging people from more diverse backgrounds. For a start, when the scheme began, employers had to offer a minimum of 30 roles to be eligible, and this exceeded what we could offer within a relatively small organisation. So joining with a consortium of charities under one umbrella project enabled us to get around that. However, this cri criterion has since been removed, so you can actually just apply for a single um, funding for a, a single role within your organisation. But here is a list of the organisations which are part of the project. So you can see a few recording schemes in there, including uh, British Trust for Ornithology, Bumblebee Conservation, um, yeah, RSPB in there as well. Um, yeah, so it's it's just been a really valuable project. And the Race for Nature team also offered invaluable support to employers when it came to recruitment and other ongoing support and guidance. Plus, they organised training webinars, which helps increase our understanding of the various barriers to gaining a more diverse workforce and supporter base, and how we can work towards recognising and removing barriers. Um, <clears throat> our two kickstart roles are a volunteer engagement officer within the MBMP team and a project assistant within the science team. So these are Isis and Anna pictured here. Um, so the kickstart scheme pays minimum wage for 24, 25 hours a week for six months. And with our own within our own budgets, we were able to find some money to top this up to London living wage. A key goal of the Race for Nature project is to recruit people from ethnic minority backgrounds. We were hopeful that as we were recruiting through Stockwell Job Centre, we would get a range of applicants reflecting the very diverse communities that live within the borough of Lambeth. Um, to begin with, we were actually getting scarcely any applicants at all, and this was after we'd already had significant delays waiting for the Department of Work and Pensions to complete the administration of vacancies. Um, however, we heard through Race for Nature that other participating organisations were having more success after having online meetings with local job coaches, which meant these these coaches were really primed to promote the vacancies to the young people they were working with. And I eventually managed to make a good contact with um, someone at Stockwell Job Centre who did quite a bit to promote our vacancies at their weekly job fairs. Though attendance numbers at, the, at these fairs were actually quite low due to COVID. And unfortunately, my request to meet with job coaches didn't actually get anywhere, but we did start to see things pick up a bit and we had um, enough promising candidates to invite to interview. However, only one of these was actually from an ethnic minority background and she dropped out on the day due, due to a change in personal circumstances. And it was really a bit surprising as well as disappointing not to get more diverse candidates when recruiting specifically within this borough. So there's really something we need to address there in terms of kind of how we perhaps, you know, make our roles seem more attractive, perhaps to more diverse audiences that I don't, I don't know, or more work, just actually kind of engaging audiences at a younger age and, you know, puts the idea of working conservation, so that seed in their minds. However, having said that, we are really happy with, with, um, our, our, um, with um, Isis and Anna, they've been doing really, they're really dedicated to the key aim of engaging more diverse audiences, and they're doing really excellent work towards this. Um, and I'll go into a few of their work areas now. So Isis has been doing a lot of work researching influencers who are working to engage minority groups in nature. So we've had some initial response from Black to Nature, Flock Together, Black Girls Hike, and mosaic outdoors. Um, 
so Black to Nature, we'd already formed a relationship with earlier this year, um, and we, we had a really good meeting with, um, I think now we've gone to, got to the busy season, it's, you know, they're really busy organising stuff and we're finding it's a bit harder to kind of get them to sort of, you know, promote the things we want promoted, so that, that's been a bit of a lesson. And I think it's been similar with, with the other influencers who've shown interest, but um, I think we kind of really need to do more work to sort of build up a relationship. And it seems that what's, what is probably happening is these influencers, they're, they're getting a lot of requests from um, other people to really sort of help engage more diverse audiences in what they're doing. And, you know, if they don't respond straight away, then it disappears off social media prob probably and, you know, might not get seen. So um, perhaps maybe in the quieter period over the winter, we'll we'll see if we can set up meetings with, with these, these, um, these groups. Um, so Anna, um, sorry, ISIS also had the great idea of reaching out to colleges and universities to promote our, our workshops, because as well as more diverse audiences, we really want to engage um, younger audiences as well. And this worked brilliantly, and particularly when ISIS phoned up the, these institutions and just managed to find exactly the right person to speak to. So there's a handful of, of colleges and universities we got responses from, and who've promoted these, these workshops that we're, we're running at the moment for younger and more diverse audiences. Um, and an amazing latest result, Justin, is that our, these workshops have attracted the attention of an assistant editor at the BBC Net Asian Network radio station, and they are really keen to talk to us about it. So we're in the process of setting up a meeting which we really hope will lead to radio promotion to a big part of, of our target audience. And, you know, we will certainly be keen to set up a, a further workshop specifically to take advantage of this. Um, ISIS is also working on encouraging young, young people from diverse backgrounds to share their bad experiences and stories on Instagram. Because one thing we have learned is that if um, people, young people or people from diverse backgrounds see people like themselves, um, visibly taking part, they are much more likely to feel this is something, something for them. Okay, try not to overrun, just a few more bits. Okay, okay so Nightwatch is our new project this year, which we're piloting. Um, so Anna, our other Kickstarter, is, is working on volunteer engagement and administration for this project, among other things. And the project is along similar lines to the British Bat Survey, which we, we've been developing and piloting over the last few years, but it has much more of a focus on engaging new audiences. So volunteers simply deploy um, bat detectors in their own gardens rather than, a, rather than in a random stratified one kilometre square. The volunteers are loaned audio moth bat detectors. These are very small, simple static bat detectors for passive acoustic monitoring. And they deploy, the, deploy them across one night in order to trigger, well, collect recordings throughout the night. And for the first hour after sunset, volunteers are also asked to watch from their window and record any wildlife observations on their survey form. Um, the, the acoustic recordings are then run through the classifiers developed, which have been developed for the British Bat Survey and the species identifications will be reported back to the volunteers. So um, it's really been aimed at urban audiences. Um, so we focused on London, Birmingham and Manchester. And we, we hoped that by really focusing on urban audiences, we would um, naturally get more diverse audiences. But um, I think, you know, in so many, as in with so many other things we've done, we, we find it's, nev it's never quite as simple as that. So Anna is now reaching out to community, community gardens, organisations, which tend to um, have a much more representative um, sort of group of people involved in them, you know, really representative of, of you know, the areas they live in. So this looks like a really promising lead for, for getting a much more diverse audience involved in Nightwatch. OK, so um, just a couple more bits to finish off. So a couple of recent um, gains, which is which is quite nice to see. So, so first of all, on the left hand side, you can see um, the current results from our online demographic form that is part of the sign up process. And one area where we've actually seen a really 
notable improvement is in the proportion of younger people signing up to the MBMP. So you can see the results from the Birdsong questionnaire, which polled um, a sample of our existing volunteers. And in the 16 to 20 year old category, less than 1% of respondents were in that in that group. Whereas in the signups in the last three years, we've got 2.9% of the signups are in that 16 to 20 age group. And similarly with 21 to 25, it's now in out of recent signups, it's 10.9% compared to 2% from the Birdsong questionnaire. And you know, also about a doubling for the 26 to 30 age group. So um, it certainly appears to show an increase in younger people signing up, which is really great. And I think it's really thanks to a lot of the work that um, Isis and Anna have been doing to reach out to people. And then um, on the right hand side of the screen, so this is um, the results from a, a de demographic form that goes with our um, workshop booking form for the two workshops Parvathy is running at the moment, which is aimed mainly, well, particularly targeted at um, ethnic people from ethnic minority backgrounds, but has, has also been promoted to students more widely. And we are really pleased with this because this actually looks like a much more representative kind of cross section of, of um, British society. So, you know, as, as to be expected, 65% are white or identify as white. But it's great to see 15% from Asian or Asian British backgrounds. Um, also representation from black um, African Caribbean black British backgrounds, 10% mixed multi-ethnic and also other ethnic group represented. So, you know, these are obviously small numbers for a couple of workshops, but it's actually kind of really nice to see, see you know, that we are kind of increasing diversity um, with this, with this more targeted approach. There's also organisational level actions. Um, so KIT is on the working group for the wildlife and countryside link review into um, ethnic diversity in the environmental sector. And um, the review is in fact being launched today. Um, in fact, probably this minute, KIT is actually giving a similar talk um, as part of the review launch. And it will present the qualitative and quantitative research from the first phase. And the next steps will be developing a route map for the sector. And then secondly, the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment has set up a diverse sustainability initiative. And the purpose of this DSI is to improve diversity through education, connection and transparency to support current professionals and increase appeal and access for future and potential professionals. So by signing up for the DSI, BCT is making a public commitment to improve diversity by making us positive difference to bring about change. And although it's a long term goal, the, the purpose is to improve diversity through education, connection um, and transparency um, to support. Actually, I've already said that. That's a duplication of my notes. So other partners include the Environment Agency and the RSPB. And in order to help deliver on this commitment, BCT is setting up an EDI working group to work with the senior management team to champion EDI help create a diverse and inclusive working culture at BCT and to consider, prioritise and help implement actions to improve our EDI and ensure it is embedded into every operation at BCT. And the aim is that members of the group will be drawn from across the organisation, ideally with representation across teams and across staff trustee levels so that the group is truly representative of, of the whole organisation. And finally, thank, as a result of all the learning we've had from kind of our webinars with Race for Nature and the um, More Onion um, reports, we are reviewing and modifying our recruitment processes in a number of ways to make them more inclusive. For example, job descriptions have been carefully scrutinised to ensure they don't include any non-essential requirements. That could be a barrier for more diverse applicants. For example, is a degree essential for, for the role? And we're also advertising roles in places where they will be seen by a wider range of potential applicants. And to finish, a bit of a sort of. So yesterday um, I had a bit of a catch up with Parvathy and Isis and Anna and just a bit of a screen dump of some of the things we, we've personally learned from doing this. So a few, few things that have kind of been highlighted to us from from our experiences. So. 
you know, we it seems to be people from more affluent backgrounds who have been exposed to nature and developed an interest. So that might be a factor in the challenge in engaging wider audiences. Um, engaging people from a younger age is important to sow the seeds of interest that they might not get from their home backgrounds. And you might need to take actions like this where you might not actually see the benefits for several years. And also don't assume that by making your opportunities more visible to more diverse audiences, they will automatically take these opportunities. It's not as simple as that. You need to do a lot more work. You need to re really reach out and extend a hand and form partnerships. Um, for a number of years, we've had internships where we cover the expenses, but we haven't had actually the budget for paid internships. And these are hugely popular. It's always remarkable. We, we often get 100 applications for, for an internship where just the, the um, expenses are covered. So obviously there's lots of people which really appreciate getting that experience, but they're really not at all inclusive because it will be largely people from affluent backgrounds you can afford to, to take these opportunities. So we really we would really like to explore how to really um, have paid internships instead. As I mentioned, influencers can receive many requests for help. And, you know, we naively thought uh, we'll ask in these influencers to, to share a link to our workshop and we'll automatically get tons of people from diverse backgrounds booking on. But that just didn't happen. I think, you know, these these requests can just get can disappear in the huge number of requests. The, these these kind of key influencers getting. And I think as, as what's coming across from everybody is substantially improving diversity won't happen overnight or even over one year. It really needs to be a long term effort. Um, organizational changes are important, but also this and this includes additional staff capacity, which you know we often don't already have the capacity to to take on this this additional work. And it's a steep learning curve for everyone. And it was really quite instructive. That's one of our, the key people we were working with in the Race for Nature project. We had a catch up about how things had went a few weeks ago, and she was saying it was a steep learning curve for her as well, even though she was the organisation helping us and there were things she would do differently. So, you know, there's, you know, we learn from things that don't work or, you know, <laughs> things that don't happen straight away. But um, yeah, it's, I think it's really going to be a long term commitment. OK, I'm sure I've really overrun there, but I hope that was that was really helpful. Thank you so much, Philip. Yeah, that was really helpful. There's a, a huge wealth of experiences that BCT have um, experienced, so that's been extremely valuable. Um, we have overrun a bit, so um, I'm aware there are lots and lots of interesting questions on the Jamboard. I wonder if um, Philip and Sarah, you're happy to um, respond to those by email and I'll compile them and we can put them up on um, the end of the YouTube video as we have the um, in the previous session um which by the way if you did ask any questions in that previous session and you want to see the responses to your um questions then do head towards youtube um you mentioned the more onion report philip and i'm yeah, yeah very happy to circulate that around tpop okay. and i'll um share it with the jncc edi group as well because i'm aware there's a lot of them on this call as well um and if you're in jncc and not in either of those mailing lists or um groups then do just drop me or and uh, me or the tpop mailing list an email and i'll um, share it with you as well um so thank you very much everybody that's been um yeah a really interesting session and i hope everybody's enjoyed it thank you